It had come to me, not in a sudden epiphany, but with a gradual sureness, a sense of meaning like a sense of place. When you give yourself to places, they give you yourself back. The more one comes to know them, the more one sees them with the invisible crop of memories and associations that will be waiting for you when you come back. While new places offer up new thoughts, new possibilities, exploring the world is one of the best ways of exploring the mind, and walking travels both terrains. Hello, welcome to this review of Wonderlust. A History of Walking by Rebecca Solnit, which was first published in 2001. So the way this book was presented to me was not how I experienced it to be, and so in the end I found the reading experience was a, a mixed bag, and I was somewhat disappointed. I think overall because I thought it was going to be more of a politically astute work than it ended up being. The book is about various moments in the history of walking, mostly in the UK, some of the rest of Europe and America from the 18th century onwards. From philosophical considerations, Sonnet's own experiences, walking's effect on people's ability to think and write and create, and those who use walking as a political tool as a form of protest against war or environmental issues or against enclosure. Walking is represented as a desiring and inconsistent activity, redolent with different meanings and different spaces. And the book to some degree also discusses the way that gender and class has constructed the ways people access walking and how they view the activity. And it also talks about some of the differences between the city and walking in the city like and rural walking. Solnit writes, Walking returns the body to its original limits again, to something supple, sensitive and vulnerable, but walking itself extends into the world as do those tools that augment the body. The path is an extension of walking, the places set aside for walking are monuments to that pursuit, and walking is a mode of making the world as well as being in it. Thus the walking body can be traced in the places it has made, paths, Parks and sidewalks are traces of the acting out of imagination and desire. Walking sticks, shoes, maps, canteens and backpacks are further material results of that desire. Walking shares with making and working that crucial element of engagement of the body and the mind with the world, of knowing the world through the body and the body through the world. Through walking, she says, everything stays connected because this type of movement allows living in the whole world rather than interiors built up against it. This connectivity is what gives walking its revolutionary potential. Controlling walking is vital for political authority, order and productivity. The largest gap for me was the total lack of consideration of disabled people, <laughs> which is a pretty big gap. There was absolutely no attention on uh, disabled people even existing in public space, stumbling, walking, cripping through the streets. As a disabled person who has mobility issues, sometimes uses a mobility aid, but has also participated in protests and also sometimes doesn't, because I can't, I felt that that void was really obvious. Sonnet does make some remarks about like health and the need to have a particular kind of healthy body in order to walk, so she clearly does have some awareness of disability or what might stop somebody from walking, but she doesn't look into it like at all, which is really frustrating because how can you, I mean you can't write a good history of walking that doesn't include disabled people. It feels worse too because this book uses the metaphor of walking to image the like necessity and c collectivity of walking and because she pays no heed to disabled people in the way that we can and can't walk and do and don't participate, metaphorically and actively she's silencing us. Bad. Solnit writes that the whole street is for stamping out the meaning of the day. Walking, which can be prayer, sex, communion with the land or musing, becomes speech in these demonstrations and uprisings, and a lot of history has been written with the feet of citizens walking through their cities. Such walking is a bodily demonstration of political or cultural conviction, and one of the most universally available forms of public expression. When bodily movement becomes a form of speech, then the distinctions between words and deeds, between representations and actions, begin to blur, and so marches can themselves be liminal, another form of walking into the realm of the representational and symbolic, and sometimes into history. It all begs the question, what do you do when you can't walk? Solnit is clearly not interested in the answers. 
I found Solnit's class analysis to be pretty surface level. She does give instances of the ways that, especially in the UK, working class people have walked or rambled, is sometimes what it's called, and trespassed against enclosure, but then went on to write about gardens in a totally positive light, which just doesn't really make sense. She acts like gardens of the like 18th century onwards were like apolitical spaces of nature enjoyment when actually they're also a part of enclosure and they are like within the crucible of cl class war like <laughs> and I think this speaks to like a larger issue with the book itself which is that it sort of tiptoes around capitalism that it's actually speaking to when it thinks about walking and the city and enclosure and the way that people don't walk or walk less or don't get space to enjoy the natural world in the way that they should or would be beneficial to them and it's just never sort of spoken about with the directness that I think it should have been and I think that it's clear that it is it is capitalism's fault like in the chapter on gender which is called walking after midnight women sex and public space she writes other categories of people have had their freedom of movement limited but limitations based on race class religion ethnicity and sexual orientation are local and variable compared to those placed on women which is not only inaccurate to her own book because for example, she talks about the sanctions placed on working class women from walking in public space and very briefly um, some black children from the city's experience or inexperience with the natural world but also like one hell of a claim to make. I could never ever say something like that with any kind of real sense of assuredness. And I think Solnit's inattention to race, and even inattention is maybe a too kind of word for it, is really obvious in the gender chapter. She patronisingly discusses and dismisses the fears and experiences of women of colour, and sort of seems to be like pitting oppressions against each other to see which one has it worse. You know, rather than thinking about what it means holistically and intersectionally to exist in public space and walk as a marginalised person, or just literally to exist in public space as if you know there aren't people who experience all of these oppressions at once but also you know oppression can stand for itself it doesn't have to be like oh sexism is as bad as racism is as bad as homophobia or sexism is worse than racism and homophobia which is basically what she does sort of say for example she writes this as well which again shows her just like assuredness in being wrong <laughs> In public space, racism has often been easier to recognise than sexism, and far more likely to become an issue. Like, how can she be the one who would know that? Maybe some of the issues of this chapter is the time it was written, because it is 20 years old, which is something I only kind of really thought about when I was writing this review. But even so, it's pretty bad. And there's another bit as well, which I'm going to read, where I think some of the things I've been talking about really come through. In Britain, the photographer Ingrid Pollard made a series of rye portraits of herself in the Lake District, where she apparently went to try to feel like Wordsworth and felt nervous instead. Nature romanticism, she seemed to be saying, is not available to people of colour. But many white women too feel nervous in any isolated situation and some have personal experience to draw upon. I feel like that speaks for itself, but I mean, it's just so patronising and so dismissive. But many white women too have experience, as if women of colour don't have experience. And there's no considering of like, you know, what happens if you are criminalised just for existing, just for walking in space, in spaces where white people don't think you should be. If the history of walking has been shaped by gender and class, it's also been shaped by race, by the way that criminalisation affects how you can exist and experience the natural world and the city as a landscape and feeling at home in specific places. I did a bad job in this talking about the absolute lack of engagement with America's position as a settler colonial state and the violent effect that has on its understanding of nature and also the capacity to engage with the land through walking, which white America does as a form of ownership of native land. I came away wishing I could have read this book again, but if it had been like tweaked, <laughs> to be more rigorously anti-capitalist, you know, to be anti-colonial and intersectional in its approach and to actually deliver on that, because it is really beautifully written, as I hope some of the quotations that I read out do show, and definitely great in some parts, and walking as a medium or an activity for, you know, insurrectionary trouble has such revolutionary potential, and also such space for, you know, earth-loving and joy and just, like, bodily movement 
which is really lovely and really important for some people. And I will, I will give Sonnet some credit because she quotes from the very sexy dykey novel by Sarah Shulman called Girls, Visions and Everything at the end of the gender chapter. Leela walked in the streets like someone who had always walked in the streets and for whom it was natural and rich. She walked with the illusion that she was safe and that the illusion would somehow keep her that way. Yet that particular night, as she went out for cigarettes, Leela walked uneasily, her mind wandering until it stopped of its own accord on the simple fact that she was not safe. She could be physically hurt at any time and felt, for a fleeting moment, that she would be. She sat on the trunk of a 74 Chevy and accepted that this world was not hers, even on her own block. If you're looking for more eco-political work, and you're interested in some of the threads that Sonia did or should have talked about, then I would recommend some of the following. Well, firstly, I'd recommend checking out some of the work of Ingrid Pollard, who was mentioned in the quote I read out. The second thing is the poetry collection That Winter the Wolf Came by Juliana Spar, which contains some really luminous and beautiful moments of group walking in a city together and in walking making a better space, a better world, reinterpreting relationships of care with each other and lusting after non-revolution in a really poetic and honestly such an accurate way. <laughs> I definitely think that if you want more anti-capitalism and you liked Wanderlust then That Winter the Wolf Came is like the direct path forward for you. <laughs> for some crit perspectives on eco-literature and eco-criticism then I would really recommend the article Why Is It Always A Poem Is A Walk by Dr Polly Atkin. It's just incredible and the last section makes me cry whenever I read it so. For some reflections on blackness and hiking in America then I would recommend the article How Black Books Lit My Way Along the Appalachian Trail by Rahawa Hale. If you're looking for queer ecology perspectives, then I would recommend Unnatural Passions, Notes Towards a Queer Ecology by Catriona Mortimer Sanderlands. If you're looking for some really good writing, then I would recommend This Living Mountain by Nan Shepherd, which I read four years ago, so maybe it's not holding up to my recollection, but it's really beautifully written and it's um, Scottish, which is cool to read, nature writing from Scotland. If you want to read more about enclosure, then I would recommend the book Stop Thief, The Commons, Enclosure and Resistance, yes, by Peter Leinbaugh, which is a collection of essays. Also, I just thought I would say, in, in, I may as well, talk about some books that I would like to get to that are also maybe in the similar vein as Wanderlust. The first one is actually mentioned in the notes towards a queer ecology, and that's North Enough, AIDS and other que clear, clear cuts? <laughs> queer cuts? Clear cuts by lesbian AIDS worker Jan Zeta Grover. And I really want to check out the memoir as well, um, Hidden Nature by Alice Fowler, which I think is also queer. And lastly, I really want to check out the fiction book Gardens in the Dunes by Leslie Marmon Silco. And I saw a, a great Tumblr post about it. <laughs> and that made me want to read it. Yeah, I think that's all of my suggestions. If you have any other suggestions, please let me know in the comments. I would love to hear. And I thought I would end with a really lovely quote from a quite old review of The Wild Places by Robert McFarlane. I just think it's really nice, so I'm gonna read it. <laughs> oh, it's by Kathleen Jamie. Waiting to be discovered is a wildness which is smaller, darker, more complex and interesting. Not a place to stride over, but a force requiring constant negotiation. A lifelong negotiation at that. To give birth is to be in a wild place. So is to struggle with pneumonia. If you can look down a grike, you can look down a microscope and marvel at the wildness of the processes of our own bodies, the wildness of disease. There is Ben Nevis, there is smallpox, one wild worth protecting, one worth eradicating. And in the end, we won't have to go out to find the wild because the wild will come for us. Then I guess someone will scatter our ashes on the mountaintop and someone else will complain. <laughs> can play baseball with... 37,000 feet.